It started out as a research study to describe what the elements are of a design-driven culture. But the research took an unexpected turn when the stories of the participants unveiled a disturbing pattern. The day-to-day -day reality of design professionals is not what most expect, and not in a good way. In this conversation, you'll hear everything about the research, about the most important insights, and how you can use them to find more meaning and joy through your work. Here's the guest for this episode. Let the show begin. Hi, my name is Mauricio Moyes. This is the Service Design Show number 186. Hi, I'm Mark and welcome back to the Service Design Show. On this show, we explore what's beneath the surface of service design. What are the hidden and invisible things that make the difference between success and failure, all to help you design great services that have a positive impact on people, business and our planet. Our guest in this episode is Maurizio Magnas a well-respected leader in our field who has had many roles, including being the service design professor at SCAD and most recently being the service design director at Truist. We're in a very interesting time as a community. More and more organizations are growing their internal service design capabilities. Sure, we have layoffs every now and then, but the overall trend is pointing up. And as service design professionals, we are stepping up our game by connecting with business leaders and showing that we can be even more impactful. But even though service design is on the rise, it's no time to celebrate, as you'll hear in this episode. Because when you look under the surface at how design is adopted within a lot of organizations, you'll see that we still have a very long way to go. There are some systemic issues that aren't just wasting time and resources, they're also hurting careers and the well-being of many design professionals. When Mauricio started having conversations with some very well-respected and accomplished design professionals to uncover what a design-driven culture looks like on a day-to-day -day basis, he uncovered through the stories that the pattern that emerged looks a lot more like workplace bullying instead of what one might expect from a design-driven culture. It turned out the things like social exclusion and verbal hostility weren't isolated events that just a few individuals experienced. They were the disturbing commonality amongst many design professionals. And findings like this were just the tip of the iceberg. The outcomes of the research have recently been published. So I invited Mauricio on the show to share the most important insights with us. Not to blame or point fingers, but just to get a deeper understanding of the situation design is currently in. So if you stick around till the end of the episode with us, you'll know what workplace bullying actually means from a designer's perspective. What the systemic issues are that are creating this harmful environment and what we can do to take the first step in order to try and fix this. I hope you're ready because this is going to be a very important conversation. So sit back, relax, and enjoy the chat with Mauricio Mayas. Welcome back to the show, Mauricio. My pleasure. Always a pleasure talking to you. Uh, I had a look in the Service Design Show archives and uh, the last time we officially spoke on the Service Design Show was back in, uh, I think it was January 2017. So that's six wow. years ago in episode number 20, Mauricio. Mm -hmm. And now we're at 186. Isn't that amazing? Yes, it's amazing. The work you're doing with this uh, series is awesome. Great. Some people call it crazy. <laughs> but it will preserve a history of the the field, right? That's uh, amazing. A snapshot in time. That's true. I haven't yeah. looked at it like that. Yeah. And I think uh, if somebody would have the courage to sort of analyze the episodes, like they could make a, make a snapshot of the service design field every six months. And I think we would definitely see some patterns emerging and trends evolving. Yeah. 
yeah, don't get me started. That would be interesting to do for sure. For sure. Uh, nowadays, with AI, I think that's going to be a, a much more feasible uh, act. But uh, anyways, Mauricio, yeah. uh, good to have you back on. We've spoken outside of the show quite a few times as well, but it's good to have you officially back on. For the people who have no clue who you are, have never heard of you, uh, haven't seen your name online, could you give a quick intro into what you do these days? Um, so I'm originally from Brazil, um, a city called Florianópolis, the southern part. Uh, moved to the United States in 2015 to teach at the Savannah College of Art and, and be the grad program coordinator of service design. And uh, left SCAD, joined uh, Truist Bank as a service design director, and left the bank in uh, the end of March this year, 2023. And I'm working as an independent consultant focusing on service design and AI, uh, taking this time to really dive deep into how can we use AI tools, not so much to provide services, but in our uh, practice, right? That's my main focus for now. We'd love to talk about that topic uh, as well, but that's not the focus of this conversation. Uh, sure. I'm really interested in computer-aided service design through AI. That would be, uh, that is already yeah. happening and uh, there's a lot to yes. explore there. Mauricio, um, before we dive into uh, today's topic, the research, I have a lightning round, which you haven't experienced before. I have five questions for you. Um, just answer them as quickly and as briefly as possible. Just the first thing that comes to your mind. Uh, and the sooner, the quicker we get through these questions, usually the better it is. And this is just to get to, your, to know you as a person next to the professional. Are you ready? Perfect, perfect, ready. If you could recommend just one book for us to read, which book would you recommend? Oh my God, you're asking a uh, reader, heavy reader. So, as quickly as possible, Mauricio. Okay. Um, <laughs> the first one that comes to your mind. I would recommend uh, one book that really changed my life was um, Truth and Method by Hans Gord Gadamer. Um, heavy reading, but um, it really was important. For mm. Usually, the heavy readings are the ones that are uh, impactful. So, thank yeah. you. Uh, moving on to question number two. Let's see if this one is easier. What did you want to become when you were a kid? I wanted to be an aircraft builder. Um, that's still my hobby today. I love building aircrafts and uh, mm. remote controls. And oh, nice. Things that sort of, I'll bring my yeah. drones next time I'm around and then we can do some flying. Awesome. <laughs> yeah, I guess that's, that's uh, an excuse for us to have uh, these kind of playful uh, hobbies. Mm -hmm. uh, Mauricio, you are now in Savannah, but if you could pick a place to work from anywhere in the world, which place would you pick? I have a strange relationship with Madrid. Um, I'm usually a, a, a small town person. I love small town, but Madrid for many reasons. I've been there since I was a kid several times and always surprised me that I've never lived in Madrid. So I actually don't know, but would be Madrid. Mm. Would be messiness and a big city and i don't know i, I love madrid noted um and uh the fourth question is what's always in your fridge um yogurt and ice cream i can leave out of ice cream which flavor the year. Uh, mostly fruits mm. mango pineapple mm. I'm not very much into the sugary 
think more like this. Uh, all right, all right. Truth flavor. I could leave out of this. Fifth question, tradition, and again, Mauricio, challenge to you. Keep this one brief because I know you could spend a whole episode talking about this one. When did you first learn about service design? I learned about service design was around 20, 2005, 2006, after a project, IT project that went really bad. And I desperate to find a better way to do this. Like there must be a way to, a better way to do, develop uh, softwares. And I found service design and connected to Professor Birgit Mager. And it changed my life, right? It's, um, there we go. <laughs> and the rest is history. history. Thank you. Thank you for this uh, lightning round, Mauricio. Uh, always nice to learn a few things about you that I didn't know personally as well. Um, awesome. Let's dive into the main topic of today's episode, the research you did. We're going to unpack, try to unpack as much as possible, but the research like there's always more to explore. So this isn't going to be a comprehensive, all encompassing explanation of what it is, but we want to give enough information that gets people curious, uh, that's already applicable that they can use and take and run with it. But there's always more to read and learn. So uh, yeah, let's, let's see uh, how practical we can make it. So let's start at the beginning. Um, I've been referring to the research, but what is the research? What is the study? At? What is it called uh, that you did and that you recently published the results from? Yeah. So that was a series of interviews with um, designers in North American, working on in North American corporations. And uh, I tried to capture their daily ordinary experiences right but as a designer what happens to you in corporation not macro things but in the daily ordinary activities daily work acti activity and that resulted in a paper when they start to uh, tell me their experience their daily workplace experiences. Yeah. So it almost it almost sounds like you did a typical user research study a day in the life of, but in this case, yeah. I'm a service design professional, wondering yes. why nobody uh, had thought of this uh, before. Um, how, what made you uh, embark on this journey to explore this? Because you might assume like, we already know what service design professionals do on a day-by-day -day basis. You teach this stuff, so. Yeah. Like, why did you do this? So it, it was completely unplanned, serendipitous. I started to contact some friends uh, in, in management, design, management roles in, in corporations and discuss with them what is design driven culture? Do we have a framework? Is there like a set of elements that compose a design driven culture? And in total, I don't know, I contacted 15 people in during this, trying to map the design-driven culture, and they would say, oh, uh, design-driven culture has to have an element X. So, okay, in abstract, element X is interesting, but how in a daily life this would make it a difference, right? In the work experience, how that would change. And they would tell me episodes that happened to them and mostly not pleasant episodes that they went through, right? And they say, if element we X, X was there or Y, um, that would not have happened. Oh, okay. As a way to justify why that person was um, advocating for that specific element. And when I start to collect those eye level experiences, they start to cluster into four groups, 
Hmm. And um, and okay, what 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 is this? Right? Um, what groups are these? They were very similar. And then uh, uh, I did a literature review around these four types of uh, experiences. And actually, the literature, the academic, the research literature that talks about these four experiences uh, is the literature about workplace bullying. So that's the breakdown, right? Like, what? All these people, in my opinion, well placed, su successful in organizations are experience these four types of uh, workplace bullying. What is this? Then I shift gears and started to contact them about this. So hold on, Mauricio, before we dive into that, because, mm -hmm. okay, so you start out trying to explore what is a design-driven culture, right? That's your initial question. Not in theory, but what does it look in practice I'm assuming yeah. you're expecting to hear about the context that the organization has created, like, I don't know, budgets, uh, teams, uh, forms of sport, like all the, you're expecting to hear something like this, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, the structure, but you, you hear yeah. something else. Yeah, so whenever I explain, oh, why this would be valuable, right? Oh, if we have a budget, if we have a, independent structure, why justify to me why this would be important, right? The, 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 the interviewee, I would ask the interviewee, and they say, for instance, this happened to me, blah, blah, blah. Tell usually a very not so good experience and say, if the budget or whatever was in place, I would not have gone through this, mm. Mm. right? So mm. that was the, the, they were trying to advocate for what element they want to add and trying to do so, they would say, or tell me an experience that wasn't pleasant. Uh, that's how uh, I started to collect uh, This experience, right? Oh, if we had an independent structure or a budget, this would not happen. And then immediately start to become way more interesting to talk about the hmm. lived experience than the abstract thing yeah. of oh, okay, oh, whatever. So yeah, so um, the enabling the enabling factors of a design-driven culture, like that was your initial hunch. Turns out that people were much more interested to share about what it's what it feels like to be a design professional inside an organization. And uh, that made you flip the research to focus more on those experiences and document yeah. what is it like, what is it actually like, not according to the theory, but based on lived experiences. And while going through these conversations, a few patterns emerge, correct? Yeah, yes. So the four uh, types of experience that they were uh, telling me or sharing with me are um, social exclusion, which felt like strange, social exclusion. And that's the, the technical name, right? They didn't say this. They said, oh, I was not involved in high-level meetings or strategic meetings or important decisions. Whenever the I was consulted, the, there was already some kind of decision made. Um, then they also refer to ways that their work were, was obstructed and actually the, the technical name is obstruction, right? Work obstruction. You try to achieve something and you are somehow uh, prevented or lured into 
something else and you can't finish what you tried. So the yeah, other, let, me comment, let me comment briefly yeah. on that one. So that's, um, mm -hmm. and I haven't checked with you, but uh, please let me know if these were mainly people inside an organization rather than an agency. I'm assuming they were. But the thing yeah. that I've been hearing uh, quite often is um, a comment in the form like, they've hired me as a service design professional. And now that I'm in, the organization isn't allowing me to do the work that they actually hired me for. And that, yeah. that, that's, it's not uncommon. Like it's not, it, it's not always the case, but it's not uncommon mm -hmm. to hear a comment like that. Yes. And, and the surprising fact was I tapped into people on management level in large organizations, like my network. So if you check the, the, the population that was uh, interviewed, you will see clearly they are my, uh, my network, right? 71% um, uh, worked on companies of uh, 7,000 employees or more on North America, 51% um, male, 40 something female, 80% um, had a, a master degree or higher. So mm -hmm. people that would not be uh, innocent or ignorant of the situation, right? So mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's, that's very interesting to hear about the context. And I'm sure that uh, within the research, you document even more about who the group is. Um, so you mentioned social exclusion as the first pattern, obstruction. Uh, Work and then obstruction, you had, and then verbal you had two hostility. More. Verbal, verbal hostility. hostility, yeah. Yeah, uh, people uh, diminishing what someone said during a meeting uh, in a very uh, top-down way, right? Ah, this makes no sense. That's bullshit or something like this. And then stereotyping. Oh, they're, they're designers. You know, designers is creative people, right? So uh, the consistency throughout. And one thing that was interesting was uh, talking to them, people that I consider and admire highly, right? Um, they were kind of self-blaming. They were saying, oh, I should have done this. I should have done that. Oh, I, that, that was my fault. I, I, I was not able to communicate. But when you put this all in perspective, right? Uh, at the end, I talked to more than 25, interviewed more than 25 people, and then uh, had uh, 13 uh, surveys, on the theme responded. And when you put this in perspective, Sylvia blamed herself because she did X and should have done A. John did A and think he should have done X. And no matter what, the result was always the same, right? So it's kind of like whatever you try, at the end, the, this happens, right? And, and again, I'm not talking to junior or uh, initial young uh, career designer, right? No, I'm, I'm talking to experienced designers. And at some point, the self-blaming didn't make much sense, right? Mm. Well, yeah, I can imagine. Um, and I also, unfortunately, I... Uh, resonate a lot with what you're saying because those are the stories I also hear, for instance, um, with the in-house service designers that I sometimes often speak to. Um, and when it's just you uh, and you have no benchmark, you don't hear the stories of others, like it, the first thing that you do is you assume that it's you because other people within the organization somehow do manage to be successful, right? If somebody department A, B, or C is successful and you're not, is it, it, might, it might feel like that it's your fault, right? Yeah. So yeah, yeah. these four things, you mentioned workplace mm -hmm. bullying. When did you 
when when did this epiphany happen uh that you realized hey something we are we are seeing a much bigger systemic issue here yeah that's exactly right when you interview like uh, we talked about i guess it was 27 interviews by the 10th right in, uh, in in total total since the design driven culture it's more than 50 half an hour chats but when we decide to focus on this um having done like uh, 23 prior to to the ones we started to focus on this and then the by the tenth that you're specifically asking for these uh experiences uh, you you can't ignore a trend right? it, it was blunt like uh, I didn't have to uh, dig deeper. It's well thrown on, on me, uh, this uh, harsh environment that they were uh, experiencing. How, how did you feel about this? Like you're at some point you're like, I'm onto something. And then how did, how did you as a service design professional who has a passion for this field uh, feel about this? It was not a pleasant experience. Um, I, I have to, to tell you at some point when I was in the really at the midst of the, the, the thing, uh, family, friends were always asking, are you depressed? What, what, what's happening? Because the, the shock was, it was a breakdown, right? Uh, using Alveson's concept of breakdown, like, oh my God, I'm talking to people who I admire, who I reach out for advice, and they are telling me that their experience, all this uh, intelligence and experience that I see in, uh, in them, didn't protect them from having this sort of experience, right? And having taught and having connection with many young designers I could I couldn't uh, refrain or avoid becoming sad for them in a way right? it's uh, uh on the one hand you could sort of like uh, maybe gain an even deeper sense of respect for these people who are in these situations and still advocating for the value of design, still pushing for a human-centered perspective, uh, even though like all the odds are stacked against them and they, they feel it. Like um, maybe they have become resilient to it or just ignore it. Or like, I, I would be curious to hear some of these coping strategies that you found. But uh, on the other hand, like you said, it's, it's hard to ignore that you also feel sorry for these people because we wish them all the best. <laughs> we want them yeah, to yeah. succeed. So, yeah, not yeah, a question the, here, the, but just a, a remark. Yeah, yeah. The the thing it was they were all self blaming, right? Owning. Now that was my uh, responsibility to make it work. But again, and all protected by non disclosure agreements, right? They were mostly or most of them were talking about past experience in, in, in the time frame sense the oldest one that was told me was in 1998 and the most recent one is, was in 2023 and um, again the consistency and clarity of this uh, experience ask begs the question, right? It's not their fault. There must be something on playing on top of this, a systemic. Oh, so this begs the question, how do we label this systemic thing? Is, is that workplace is, is that described as workplace bullying or do you have other ways to capture that yeah so the the first uh, connection was work with the literature on workplace bullying 
And then Alveson has a, a known, very well-known paper on uh, advertising agencies. And uh, he makes in this paper a connection between femininity and creativity and how this impacts how creative professionals uh, are treated and treat others. And it, that's the, the, the connection that was interesting because it puts the, the problem that designers are facing, not as a thing against designers, but is the same uh, modus operandi that uh, creates the gender gap, the pay, gap between women and men, um, the lack of uh, minorities or uh, in, in, in higher, higher ranks in organization. At the end, it's all the same thing. It's this uh, male-dominated world, right? Uh, and everything that sounds holistic, empathic, creative is labeled as Feminine. That's the um, both in terms of uh, the literature in workplace bullying that kind of nudges you to this uh, in order for you to ascend in an organization. You need to be male in a sense, the aggressive and heartless and uh, concrete in a way. And um, then the connection that Alveson does, it's, it's un, unforgiven, right? There's no way for you to not see the, the picture. So when I start to go back to the interviewees and say, hey, this is what I'm seeing, that's when I started to hear them say, oh, okay, so organizations treat designers like women in several different wordings and tones uh, from surprising to, oh, okay, makes sense, right? Um, so that was also a very cathartic moment. Okay, so we're not dreaming. When, when you present, and that's the, the, the tone of the, the article at the end, the Touchpoint article that published, uh, the, the intention was just to describe, right? We're not raising any controversy or stark, uh, catchy sentences, right? Um, but when we start to present afterwards, we had this SDN Cafe uh, with the first presentation of the results. The reaction was the same, like, okay. Uh, designers are treated like women, right? Not women, the sex, the sex assigned at birth, let's say, but the stereotypical uh, femininity traits. So the word is uh, femininity, not mm -hmm. women, right? Mm -hmm. But that's the how people, the knee jerk reaction was, oh, oh so they're treated like women. And yeah, what what does that mean? Few discussions I had with uh, more the academics uh, about this. Um, the two two ways, I guess. Right, one is oh, okay, so we're part of a bigger thing. We're not the ones that are um, prosecuted or. or uh, it's not personal. It's not about design. personal, right? It's yeah. not design. It's a bigger picture. Is everything that is not this stereotypical cis cisgender white male in inter intersectionality, right? It, it the lo the far you are from this cisgender uh, white male, the more you will be bullied. Uh, yeah, the, the more you'll have to, the more struggle you will experience on your journey. Yes, your journey. Yeah, 
Yeah, and and that goes into all dimensions, not just design, yeah. but it could be people of color, like you said, or whatever women. form of quote yeah. unquote women, quote unquote minorities. Um, yeah. This is encouraging and that, that, that's at the, the same time. The, the, yeah, but that's the, the the thing that I was kind of um, happy, if we can use mm -hmm. the word happy. Is like, oh, okay, so we're we're part of a broader issue, right? Mm -hmm. uh, we have more allies to tap into, right? It's not just, oh, let's see how designers can fit better in an organization. It, it's broader mm -hmm. and, and way more, in my opinion, interesting. Uh, so, yeah, some people who are listening to this right now will be like, you know, I've been experiencing this thing all my life already because, again, I'm somebody of color. I'm from... Uh, a third world country, whatever, like <laughs> they will be listening to our conversation. Like, what are you talking about? This is my daily reality. But uh, yeah, you are. Yeah. Um, so, uh, yeah, Mauricio, um, hmm. one thing we didn't yet tap into, and this may be a sidestep for a minute, but uh, you mentioned that you just wanted to capture reality, like create a snapshot in time, rather instead of giving maybe a judgment. Um, and I think part of your, the way you communicate the insights or the outcomes is through a mm -hmm. journey map, correct? And can you tell yes. us a bit more about that? So they started to point, again, every time that they were mentioned things that happened to them, they would place this in time in a sequence, right? In a context. So the journey kind of started to present itself. And as a service designer, so that's a journey, right? If you joined, you just joined the, 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 the organization, you would have more stereotyping kind of uh, events. And later on, you have more work uh, in the middle you have more work obstruction and later on social um, exclusion right it seemed to have a sequence um, it would change if you're working on a independent org inside your the, the company or the design org was part of uh, IT or marketing, whatever, right? So the journey kind of like revealed itself, right? And if if you if you if you're a hammer, if you have a hammer, everything is a nail, right? So it was easy, obvious for me that okay, we need to put this into a graphic. And if you want to see this graphic, you you share this online so people can easily access this. Um... Yes. And I'm going to jump back from uh, question to question because so many things are on my mind here. Um, I want to I want to circle back to what you said about um, people maybe you take blaming themselves for not being able to achieve success. Um, I, I want to talk with you about the balance in taking ownership of the issue versus uh, being the victim and pointing like they don't understand me like you see like we're we're being treated like women it's 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 their fault so it's it's very it seems to be very polar it's like you're either the victim or you take full ownership and then it's like you might get depressed from that is is there like it, there must be a third strategy because both of these don't seem to be uh, very healthy no no yeah the Precise, right? So at first they were blaming themselves. I should have done this, should have done that. Um, and at some point we saw, no, this is a major uh, issue, a bigger issue. And it's not, um, sometimes you would hear a reference to a specific person. Oh, that manager was awful. But then you see, 
this kind of complaints uh, going all over. And again, referring back to the academic research, um, they say it's not a bad actor, right? A bad actor would not be able to act that badly if there was not a support system. So clearly the past showed them all. It's, it, it, don't, don't try to pinpoint the bad actor because this becomes me against you, right? Like, oh, I'm right, you're wrong. And, and, uh, and, and the literature is very clear on suggesting this, right? Don't try to find the, of course, um, reserving um, clear legal issues, like unlawful behavior, um, mostly they fit into this larger picture, right? There is a system that rewards a certain behavior. And even um, uh, when I was uh, providing the first return of the results, several women that were had um, grown and ascend in, in, in corporations, they were all very honest, saying, no, yeah, I'm, I play male in order to go up. Um, so yeah. it's, uh, it's bigger than, uh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, well, the, the good thing about this is that um, we should be really good at analyzing this by zooming out, taking a more holistic view, not making it personal and just like the third strategy is let's understand the system like you said that we are part of mm -hmm. how is it rewarding certain types of behavior and then look at that and change the the context change the system that we're in easier said than done uh, most likely but uh, yeah. yeah that's that's probably the most helpful approach so now that we have this uh, this this observation this snapshot this uh, these insights how do we actually use it to to improve the situation assuming that we want to improve the situation assuming that there is something that needs to be fixed and i think there is but um. the article itself just presents a, a picture right the journey map and suggests that people should discuss over as a boundary object right Say, so, hey, oh, this happened to me, this happened to Sylvia, this happened to John, and there are all these things that might happen forward, right? Just the discussion, the uh, integration of this discussion into a larger picture involving minorities and women um, would, would be the, the way forward, especially uh, for designers, right? You you give designers the, the the context, and they will find out a way to uh, apply or design the journey forward, right? So I, we yeah. refrain from from providing any type of suggestions or solutions to the. Yeah, I can also imagine Mauricio that sure, this is going to be uh, hopefully very empowering to designers to start a conversation around this topic. At the same time, these organizations that hire design professionals that want to create, apparently, who want to create a design-driven culture or bring design into the organization, um, I'm hoping that they want to do that in a successful way, that they don't want to waste resources, time, they don't want to fail. And this could be a piece of the puzzle to show, like, if you put design in a system in an environment which looks like this, then these are the outcomes that you can expect. So like even yeah. before you, it's not a disclaimer uh, or it's not a manual, but it's creating awareness about like the, the garden metaphor comes up over and over again. But if you're trying to plant design on, uh, I don't know, uh, in, a, in a desert, it's not going to work. Uh, 
yeah. right? So, yeah. like, yeah. what kind of soil do you need? Uh, does it make yeah? Does yeah. this make sense that organizations could use this? As well? Yeah. So we're speaking in terms of cost, right? So uh, talking with the senior designers, uh, several of them, uh, several of them uh, went through this process in three different organizations, right? So hire designers, establish a design team. At some point, there's a economic crisis. There's a they are. Uh, cancel, right? Uh, mm -hmm. Let go. This is a tremendous cost, right? If organizations are trying to do this more than once, right? Uh, even in terms of diversity, equity, and inclusion, right? Uh, adding more diverse people and they are uh, failing, there is a cost to this, right? So, uh, one of the, 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 the senior designers that I presented the journey map, he told me, Maurice, if I had this journey map during a few meetings, very important meetings that I had with top managers at my company, it would have made a huge difference, right? To have someone to point and show and a boundary object, right? To discuss those issues would have made. I don't know exactly what he would have done or how mm -hmm. he would argue or discuss or talk about this, but the, he pointed to the fact that just to have this outlined is hmm. powerful. Now, um, I'm, uh, <laughs> I'm assuming that with every research you do, it leads to insight, but it also leads to at least three new questions. Where do we go from here, Mauricio? What needs to be explored next from your perspective? Um, one, so going back to the start, right? What is the design driven culture? And uh, the discussion, and especially if you read uh, Herbert Simon's uh, work, you understand that business is design right business as designing right you, you uh, organizations are always trying to uh, devise uh, uh, ways to change prefer uh, change current situations into preferred ones right so one thing that would be interesting to to moving forward is to make it clear especially for management, uh, students, and, and, and future professionals, how design is core to business, not graphic, not interface, the knowledge of how to devise ways to change current situations into preferred ones, right? Oh, we need to increase sales. We need to, this process is defined as design. So one thing would be to share this more clearly. Uh, the other, put the design that is a core, again, going uh, by Simon's work, that is a core uh, feature in an organization in this um, broader perspective of gender gap, pay gap, and, and diversity, right? Um, I think broaden, broadening. Mm. The, the scope of designers' uh, concern of uh, fitting to organizations to this, hey, it's a, a broader picture, would help minorities and women, would help designers, would help, would help everybody, right? Having designers actually feeling the heat with the experiences of these people as their own, right? Like, okay, I, I'm, I'm facing exactly uh, the same consequences of the same uh, uh, cause, right? Those two things would be, mm. I think, in my opinion, right? Like uh, these senior designs, whenever I presented the journey map, they thought about very tactical things, 
that they would do with the journey map itself, right? Like daily negotiations, uh, conversations, uh, convincing. Uh, but I think the two major ones would be this. Like, uh, not not saying that business needs to uh, treat designers better, but no, business is design, business as designing, right? And having this broader picture, like adding designers to these other communities that are uh, facing the same challenges. Those two things, in my opinion, are. Yeah, let's let's schedule a follow up in a in a year time. See what happens, Maurizio. Um, what if you could give a call to action for anybody who's listening and resonates with this message? What would you what would you hope that they would do? What is something that they could do based on our conversation today? Um, what I would suggest is. Take this, uh, download the journey map, assess your situation, what, which of these uh, experiences you've been through, uh, and start sharing this with your uh, colleagues at work, your organization, uh, as politely as possible, share the the this connection between femininity and design with the diversity equity and inclusion people i think this would give a leverage for their work too right if you make the the, the connection between design is a core capability of businesses and businesses are not profiting as much as they could because we have all this um, systemic uh, discrimination against women. So I think everybody would win right, in, in sharing and understanding that journey map. I will make sure to add all the relevant links in the show notes. Uh, we will be discussing your findings with our circle community, seeing uh, how that resonates. Uh, I have some assumptions about that. Uh, we'll see how that goes. Mauricio, if somebody uh, would like to reach out to you regarding this research, is there a way to get in touch with you? Yes, um, I've uh, posted a summary of the discussions that were that happened already on LinkedIn. Um, I'll, I'll be happy to, to discuss. Uh, this morning, I had a, a person also uh, that reached out to me yesterday. So I'm, I'm trying to keep some windows on my schedule to discuss the, the results with people that are interested. And I'm sure that you're open to any suggestions, but if is there anything in particular that you hope people will reach out with to you? Is there anything you are looking for specifically? I guess it's uh, how can we, in a tactical level, right? Like in a, again, high level, ordinary workplace experience, how can we devise ways or actions or tactics that would change the current situation to preferred ones, right? If they have any idea on how to, I level, right? I'm working on my desk and by doing this, I can nudge the system. Not yeah. like, oh, let's mm -hmm. create a program that will promote, no, 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 on a very ordinary level, right? What yeah. can we do? In, in terms of tactical, small actions. I, I would love to collect this, right? Oh, yeah. do this, nudge that. Like I'm saying, share, discuss about this journey with your colleague. Just this, uh, mm -hmm. no, no second intention, just 
share the journey with the journey map with your colleagues. Right? It's this kind of tactic, like guerrilla, small nudges. Well, yeah, that I'm, we can I'm easily to, to interrupt you here. Hmm? It's not. It's not even guerrilla. What I have found uh, in our design community is that we often neglect the nuances and details of our work and prefer like prefer to talk about the bigger picture uh, the strategies while the details the nuances are the things that make a difference on a day-to-day -day basis and somehow it feels like it's very hard for us to talk about them because like ah you know it was just a meeting or it was just a scribble or like it was just a thing um but those are the things that do make the difference and uh, i sort of I'm fully with you that we need to share more of those nuances, yeah, those you, details. You made me think about a really interesting connection. I was watching this uh, Netflix series, The Blue Zones, right? White people it. live for 100 years. So this guy located uh, communities that live for 100 years. And he said they, they don't exercise. They don't eat healthy. They don't. They embedded all exercise and eating healthy in their that it's the easiest choice for them right so there's this villa village in in sardinia that it's steepy and they have to go around there's no way to have cars they're not exercising right the the, the thing is the easiest choice hmm. right would be uh, so what were uh, making this parallel, what are the easiest, simple things that we can uh, add to our, not add, embed into our work activities that would nudge this and make it uh, a conscien conscious uh, approach, a conscious approach to this, right? So I'm adding all this easy steps and activities that will turn the tide let's uh let's take this question at least for starters into our circle community discuss it there uh see what comes up and uh i hope many people will reach out to you as well sharing these things uh, mauricio we need to slowly but surely wrap up uh, for anybody who's interested also have a look at it episode 20 uh from 2017 see who got more gray hair if it's mauricio or if it's me in the last <laughs> it's me. Uh, six, it's me. six years i don't know you already had some gray hair six years ago <laughs> true, true so uh mark so you're I, never old that mark you have you're the same that's true ever. that's true that's true but uh I encourage everybody to have a look at that video as well that episode mauricio thanks so much for coming on thanks again for doing this important work uh Painful, but uh, sort of we need to raise awareness. Uh, that's the only way to start fixing a system that is uh, that is broken, that's not working. And I'm optimistic that we can actually do this because that's one of the yeah. threats of design being optimistic. So uh, again, Mauricio, thanks uh, thanks for coming on the show. Thank you, thank you, Mark. Always an immense immense pleasure to talk to you, and uh, especially in such a touchy subject so important to many of us thank you very much for inviting me well this was a pretty loaded conversation wasn't it i'm really curious to know which question do you have right now after listening to this story leave a comment down below and we'll try to reply to all of them of course if you want to know more about the research or reach out to mauricio have a look in the show notes because all the relevant links are over there if you've made it this far into the conversation and enjoyed it, please do me a quick favor. Press the like button on this video, not to feed the YouTube algorithm, but just to let me know whether or not we're on the right track by addressing topics like this. My name is Mark Fontaine, and I want to thank you for spending a small part of your day with me. Please keep making a positive impact, and I look forward to see you very soon in the next video.